Now, throughout the immigrant experience, we have seen how workers gain respect with employment. Everyone is committed to work when decently employed. Immigrant workers throughout history are following the logic of where wealth can be redistributed. Unions have always asked for decency in meeting subsistence needs. Every immigrant community that is now part of the American social fabric develops strategies to improve the immigrant community's struggle to survive. A sense of awareness and a commitment to immigrant rights and responsibilities have always been a part of the naturalization process. So last week, we understood that between 1870 and 1920, the industrial and the political elites of both Mexico and the United States would take hold of their respective countries and organize the greatest march of economic growth in human history. They would do it with the aid of and at the expense of every conceivable uh, labor force. Black labor, white labor, Chinese labor, Asian labor, European immigrant labor, Mexican labor, Native American labor, female labor, child labor, and they would reward them differently by their race, by their gender, by their national origin, by their age, and by their social class. And this march of economic growth transformed existing social relations and introduced radical changes in production and occupational structures. And the main areas of occupation for those living in and moving to southern, uh, uh, northern Mexico and to the United States Southwest the main areas of occupation were cattle ranching, agriculture, mining, and transportation. Now, the Porfiriato in Mexico was violent. The advance of civilization through modernization, through the rise of urban centers, through immigration, through the rapid industrialization of the country, it came at the expense of the working class. It came at the expense of farmers and peasants. So wealth political power and access to education were concentrated amongst the few, both in the United States as well as Mexico. So overwhelmingly, people of European descent controlled both wealth and governmental decision-making power in Mexico. Foreign companies linked through Wall Street and headquartered in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Austin, London, Paris, and Amsterdam exercised power in Mexico. Now, the source of the wealth generated at the turn of the century that was used for the financing of mass consumption, the source of wealth generated at the turn of the century that was used for the financing of mass production was mining. Mexico, with financial backing from Wall Street, tapped into its mineral wealth. And the United States, meanwhile, developed the mineral wealth that once belonged to her neighbor to the south. So it is in this vein that we need to appreciate those miners who were working and generating this wealth. In Mexico, they were known as los mineros. Now, Arizona and New Mexico teamed with activity along with the northern border states of Chihuahua and, and Sonora. Mexicans filled the labor needs for this exploding industry. We're going to take a look at a film clip called, from, from a documentary called Los Mineros. This is a PBS documentary. And we want to get a glimpse at the process of change that occurred in Arizona at the turn of the century. We're going to watch a clip from a PBS documentary entitled Los Mineros, which is a film that is required viewing for this class. Now let's visit a place called Clifton Morenci in Arizona, and let's appreciate how racism is an instrument of power used by those in power to perpetuate their power. Let's also appreciate the rich racist legacy of Arizona, and recognize that the current crisis in Arizona, especially over SB 1070 and the recent uh, um, uh, controversy over Sheriff Joe Arpaio, is but a continuous expression of a deep-rooted hatred that whites have exhibited toward Mexicans in the state of Arizona. Let's go to that film clip. Clifton Morenci, Arizona. There's little left to remind us of the fortunes that were made and lost in these hills. Copper made this one of the richest mining districts in the United States.
thousands of Mexican workers came here. They were promised jobs and good wages. Among the first to arrive was the father of David Velasquez. He left Mexico with a few bags and a contractor's words of great opportunity still echoing in his head. My father came over to Morancy in about 1906, and uh, he used to live in Chihuahua. Apparently, the American companies uh, knew that the people from Chihuahua were experienced miners, so they used to send their people out there and recruit, and they come over with what they used to call ringanches. In other words, they they recruit a bunch of people, of men especially, and uh, bring them over all together. Most of the mineros came from the northern Mexican states of Sonora and Chihuahua, where they had been miners for generations. They were brought to a small mining district in eastern Arizona. Within a few years, Clifton Morenci grew from 200 to 10,000. The mining boom was sparked by America's enormous appetite for copper. With the arrival of electricity, copper was needed for telephone lines, telegraph service, and power plants. Newcomers from all over came to work in Morenci. They shared one thing in common, the business of getting copper out of the ground. Using candles for light, the miners spent 12 hours a day underground. They worked 4,000 feet below the surface in a maze of tunnels 100 miles long. The shafts were supported only by wooden beams. You can always hear the timber creaking like in an old house. Of course, the first thing you did when you went into your working place was look for loose boulders, loose rocks. And you put in timbers for uh, as much room as you had. And uh, you'd start drilling and just hope nothing fell on you. Work areas were cramped. The air was thin. Temperatures would rise to 104 degrees. As experienced miners, the Mineros were accustomed to harsh conditions underground. What they weren't prepared for was the way they were treated simply because they were Mexican. Sylvester Maury, an early traveler to Arizona, wrote, My own experience has taught me that the lower class of Mexicans are docile, faithful, good servants. They've been peons for generations. It is their natural condition. Mexicans were assigned the worst jobs in the mines and the most dangerous. Anglo timbermen who built the wooden supports were paid $4 a day. Mexican timbermen received $2. Anglo muckers who shoveled the ore out of the mines were paid $1.50 a day. Mexican muckers were paid 70 cents. This dual wage system persisted throughout the mining industry. They brought us for our skills, and now they treat us worse than dogs. Because we are not like them, they forget we are men. In those days, a lot of them suffered. They were the burros, the ones that did all the work in those mines. See what I mean? Those were the guys that were producing and dying in there. The Minero not only faced hardship in the mines, but also in town, a company town built chiefly by the Phelps Dodge Corporation. Like all such towns, the company owned and operated everything, from the waterworks to the hospital to the workers' homes. Miners bought their food and dry goods at the Phelps Dodge Mercantile Store, where markups of 200% were common. With a day's salary, a miner could only buy a dozen eggs and a pound of coffee. It was hard on my father because uh, he didn't know how to speak English. He didn't know how to add or subtract. 
I saw receipts from the grocery store where they would add them up. They didn't have an edit machine at that time. They add them up by, by hand. Six and six, 15. One and carry the five. Always to the store advantage. The Morenci Club was where company officials and their families spent their free time. Here they could play billiards, tennis, and bridge. The club was off limits to Mexicans, as were all Anglo establishments. Socializing between Anglos and Mexicans was strictly forbidden. This one morning when I went to work, told me the mine superintendent wanted to see me. So I went over and he said, uh, Avery, you had so-and-so up to your house last night. And I said, yeah. He said, you don't have Mexicans come to your house. And I said, well, God damn, it's my house. I'll have anybody come to it I want. He said, no, if you won't. He said, that's a company house. And he said, you work for the company. Remember that. Mexicans were forced to live in the most undesirable parts of town, usually along steep hillsides. In Morenci, the Mexican side of town was called Chihuahua Hill. Unlike Anglo neighborhoods,